Portfolio Composer, episode 176. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now, for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. Hello and welcome to episode 176 of The Portfolio Composer. This is a special episode because this is the three-year anniversary of the podcast. I want to start by giving a heartfelt thank you to all of you who make this possible for listening and for growing with me as we build our composition careers and and for supporting me along the way either as a patreon sponsor or to bring me in to speak this really is a group endeavor and i am honored that i've had this opportunity and i'm looking forward to continuing to serve you uh, by making more podcasts by doing more things to help you learn what it takes and I've got lots of plans in the works, so keep your ears open because things are going to be happening. It's going to be pretty exciting. If you have gotten any value out of the show, the the best thing you could do for me is to subscribe to the show on whatever podcast playing app you use on your phone or device, and then to share it with a friend. And if you want to support me even further, you can become a Patreon sponsor at patreon.com slash portfolio composer. But now on to this episode. So what I've done is I've looked over the last 12 months. So this would be February 2017 through January of 2018. And I gathered the data on the most popular episodes. And that means episodes that have been downloaded the most. So here are the 10 most popular episodes of 2017. And starting with number 10 is John David Mann. John David Mann has actually been on the podcast twice, but this was his first appearance in episode 118, where we discuss his book, The Go-Giver. It's actually a series of books, The Go-Giver books, and, and they are some of my favorite business books and leadership books of all time. In the books are his five laws of stratospheric success and then what it means to add value and how we can actually do what we do by serving other people. To If you don't already have someone in your life who can give you just excellent criticism, um, I, I know this is true for writing and I know that it was true for me as a composer that... I would write stuff that was pretty good, and most people I would show it to it would just be enthusiastic about it. I had to get to somebody, Peter Peter Stearns in this case, who could look at it and say, this shows promise, but he could, he could, uh, he was at a level that he could say, he could point out all the weaknesses, all the flaws. Um, to me, one of the possibly the most valuable traits of a successful writer, and this could be a successful composer, successful screenwriter, is being open, genuinely open to, hungry for great criticism, and to be, you know, continually making yourself better and better and better. I studied Mm. with a screenwriting teacher in Hollywood, a guy who I really, really really admire, who's had extraordinary success in in having his students, you know, get scripts sold. Um, So he's really pragmatic, not just a good teacher, but he really is good on the business end. And he says in Hollywood that the two things that you that you most the two biggest secrets of being a successful screenwriter are number one, just improve your craft. Your craft, your writing has to be so much better than the next guy's that it's undeniable. Um, yes, it may be, it may already be good. It can't be good. It has it can't even be excellent. It has to be phenomenal, which means you can always make it better and better and better. And that he said the other secret is to be easy to work with. Uh, Hollywood really doesn't doesn't want to work with prima donnas, despite the uh, you know the, the image that people have. I don't know about that in the composer world. I don't know if composers tend to be prima donnas or not. But I think the thing uh-huh. of refining your craft, I think you cannot you know you can't overemphasize that it, making your writing so just damn good, so mm-hmm. excellent, 
so amazing that it's undeniable. I think that's that would be number one. There's a, a fear in finding someone to be your critic, to be your editor, because yes. it requires vulnerability. Yes. How do you encourage people to pass through that? Ah, with complete and absolute unshakable faith in what you're doing. And I think that's, um, you know, sometimes I like to say you need to have, to have faith like a rock and humility like water. I, I think for me, just to, just to get through the process of writing a book, I'm in it right now. I'm, I've just finished chapter five of a, of a 10 chapter book. And I reach a point, not once, but, but frequently in the course of writing a book where I feel like I'm sitting here saying, oh man, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know, what, I don't know, I don't know how to get through this. I don't, even, I don't know where this chapter goes. I have to continually lead myself by the hand back to the place where I say, there's a, there's a great book in here. It's, I just need to find it and I will, and I can, and I will. Um, I think the only way you can open yourself up to good criticism is you just have to have and cultivate this unshakable faith that you, A, have something of unique value to say, and B, that you can, and, and, and that you will. It's there. You just have to know that's there. Um, because that, that's the only way you can you can open up your your little baby to, for other people to, to point out and say, Hmm, his ears are kind of big. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, um, you also have to be really discerning about the critique. Um, I have gotten critique. I just wrote a book last year, which, which so far has gotten the 22 rejections, but hasn't gotten the 23rd call. Um, it's, it's a book that no one's publishing and it's, I haven't experienced this for, for a while. I got this book that nobody wants to publish. I may end up self publishing it. But I got a bunch of critique that I don't believe. I don't. I don't credit. And it, this is a tricky one because, you know, you, you want you know the expression when three people say you're drunk, it's time to lie down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's how I feel about writers. You know, uh. we always feel so precious about our stuff, and I'm I'm prone to that as well. I've had some people come back and and, and give me critiques, which I've said, you know what, they're right about this. But I also right. have to have to. F trust myself to say, but that guy over there, what he said, I don't agree with him. You know, I, I think what, the way I did it was, was good. Number nine on the list of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is Thomas Goss in episode 126. Thomas is an American living in New Zealand, and he has founded an online community where he teaches orchestration. In fact, it's called orchestration online you can become a patreon sponsor of thomas's by pa going to patreon.com slash orchestration online you can follow his youtube channel you can become a member of his facebook group and i kid you not when i say this he may be providing some of the most incredible value in any online community i've personally experienced if you have questions about orchestration, about the subtle art of blending instrument combinations together, how specific instruments work, this is a great resource, and it really doesn't cost a lot to get access to it. He has online courses. He has uh, private um, score reviews that he does for his Patreon clients. It's pretty incredible. But in our conversation in episode 126, we discuss his community and we discuss what that's all about. But in this little clip here, you're going to hear him talk about what has happened to him without having any intention at all of designing this by creating his online community. The thing that I least expected to happen was that my content and my presence would become um, would become something of an authority, right? The, to the point to where I would have to be careful not to say something because I would be speaking from authority. You know, to just any time I had an important point to make, I would try to back it up with something that people could go check out rather than just saying, well, I don't think this works. You mm -hmm. know, um, it's just so tempting because you don't really have enough time in your day to correct every wrong notion. Um, but, you know, after a while... That something about a culture, you know, every community has got a culture and every culture has got um, certain approaches to knowledge. And, you know, a lot of the times that knowledge is challenged. It's also about, you know, what dialogue is all about. But 
um, you know, <clears throat> certain conversations started to coming coming up again and again and again in the group. Um, like, you know, should I score my horns, you know, with the first and second horn on the on the top staff or the first and the third horn on the staff? Well, the first and the third horn are doing the same thing. So why does it have to be on the other staff with the fourth horn? You know, and, and so on. Like, so these conversations got to be, <laughs> you know, it was almost like, you know, the old Catskills joke, you know, with all these comedians at the Catskills, you know, will just yell out a number of a joke and everybody will laugh. It was that same kind of a thing. Mm. Is that like, oh, well, you know, and we would just go through this huge conversation about it. And then two days later, somebody new would join the group and they'd say, hey, um, you know, about those horns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody would just say, no, no, shut up. So I would have to be I would have to be careful not to throw my weight around. So that was one thing that I just not did not expect because I just thought I was just sharing knowledge and I I didn't think I would have to really get involved in long conversations about defending my perspective and my and my process and everything else. Um, the other unexpected thing was that I didn't realize that I would be getting work because I was out there on the internet. As that was that I did not put out my content as a calling card as you know some kind of a thing you know but what was happening was this was that people were were using my resources hoping to get their project off the ground excited and and just really you know wanting to you know wanting to orchestrate their project and then getting in really deep in a professional way people wanting it tomorrow you know people people, you know, giving them professional opportunities and they would just set aside the resources, set aside the training and come to me and say, listen, Thomas, you know, I've been studying your resources. I've been trying to get this done, but look, I cannot finish it in time. Can you do it for me? Or, or maybe, maybe meaning to say that, <laughs> but not wanting to say that, but you know, the same exact conversation really, um, <clears throat> You know, that they so I didn't think that I would be getting work out of putting educational content out there. Um, and and then like the third thing I would say that was unexpected was that I would create some sort of an inspirational view or a, or a motivational view of of the whole craft of composing in, in any broader sense. But, you know, I started off just I stuck a little camera, um, like a, a little still camera with a video function, very cheap little piece of junk. And I just stuck it on a cardboard box and started talking to it about seven years ago. Um, or geez, how long has it been now? Oh, it's like 11 years. I just, I'm losing track of time. So 11 years ago, I just started talking to a little thing and I called that my intro to orchestration and the videos just got more and more complex and, and I became a better, you know, video editor of, uh, in an educational way, I guess. And by the time I finished my little intro series, I was just talking about the broader role of the composer in society and what to expect and how to change your world and how composers needed to move the conversation forward about art and culture and how, how important your role was in it and, and everything else. So that's something I completely did not expect. <laughs> I, you know, I just thought I was going to be giving people pointers on, you know, how to score read a Stravinsky score or something. I, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and that, I, I feel that that was something that was just pushed onto my little conversation, you know, pushed into my inspiration by just by the role of having to lead a community. After a while, you have to, you know, you sort of have to make, broader observations about why we're all doing things and what inspires us and what's our use. You know, I mean, there's, you know, art is the easiest thing to cut from a budget. You know, you can cut it from a national budget even if you want to, but I mean, yeah. it's like, it's the thing that makes life have meaning. You know, if you, if you fall in love with somebody, you'll, you know, then, you know, your, your heart immediately turns to the artistic, you know, if there is joy in life, if there's something worth preserving, something worth commemorating, art will be at the heart of that, you know, whether to capture that moment or whether to inspire it. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that we have the most necessary profession. Um, at the same time, there is no gatekeeper. Anybody can come to the table and, you know, and just do what they need to do. I mean, in my case, I've got no degree. I've got, you know, I do not have a sheepskin. Um, uh, I did not spend hours and hours at a university learning what I needed to learn. I just sort of picked it up 
working with professional musicians, getting gigs and doing things. I mean, I was a, I sort of paid my dues gigging as a professional musician and, you know, it was university was something that I just kept putting off until the point where I was teaching. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's, but in, at the other, at the same time, getting things, you know, finding processes that work right, finding connections, uh, making it a life, uh, a life pursuit. That is the most challenging thing in the world. Number eight of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 144 with Jocelyn Hagen and Timothy Takash. Jocelyn and Timothy have been entrepreneurs in the music publishing world by seeing a specific need and then going out and meeting it. In this episode, we discuss a lot about collaboration because they are married. And what does that look like to be married with and then to compose alongside the, the person that you live with? <laughs> and then they're all their publishing company, Graphite Publishing. And it's not a traditional publishing company. It, it's more like a co-op. But it's an online distribution platform for composers. I encourage you to listen to this episode to get the full picture. We also discuss at great length the art of self-publishing, what that takes, and their best thoughts about making it happen, uh, getting out into the world and promoting your own music without a publisher being behind you. I think it sounds so easy. And I've been on panels Mm. um, before where and and self-publishing comes up and everyone kind of looks at me and and, uh you know they say well you know why don't people just all people just self-publish and like it sounds so easy doesn't it you put your name on it and you put it out there but then you don't think about how are how are people going to find it you know what um is it going to be able to get on any kind of reading session so that people actually hear it um in a great context um you know all, all all kinds of advertising work and um, yeah, I mean, and we've had to um, really expand. We, we now hire people on a part-time basis to do all sorts of things for us that we don't have time to manage ourselves. Um, and that's really just happened in the last year or so. Um, but it, it never ceases to amaze me how much time we, graphite takes up in our lives. Yeah. And I also always feel like I wish I could do more right? because there's so much work that we should be doing. And so, um, but now we're getting people on board and they can help us with that. So it's good, but yeah. Um, I don't know. But. Yeah. I, I think it, um, you know, one of the things that, that I would say too, is that you, you see a lot of young composers that, that can that sort of claim themselves as a, as a self publisher or independent publisher, where sometimes that means their scores aren't very well edited or they don't, it doesn't look like a professional score. And I'm a graphic designer, so I kind of have a, a chip on my shoulder a little bit for, for the look of things. Um, and I feel like sometimes that gets short shrift because they don't spend enough time making it look presentable. And for somebody who's looking at a piece of printed material, the look is the first thing that they notice. And if it looks homespun or if it looks like they did, there was not enough time spent presenting this material, that's going to bias how they listen to the music. So if it was, looks like it was just sort of put together fast, they might think that the music was written fast or not very well or more of an amateur. Um, I also think that some people would say that they're a self-publisher when they've got PDFs of their scores online, but then there's sort of a back and forth email transaction where somebody has to actually say, hey, I'm interested in this score. How do I get it? And there's an email back that says, well, you just have to let me know how many copies and I'll invoice you. Well, can you do a PO? No, we can't. Well, can you do a credit? No, we can't. So there's this email conversation where that's not as easy for a customer to do. And it's all of a sudden creating more barriers for somebody to get your music that might otherwise just be sliding their credit card through a a big distributor like they usually do for their music. Like that's how they usually get it delivered is I've got an account, I got a credit card, I'm just going to pick these six new titles and go. It's work for people to have to discover independently published music. And so reward them by making it easy, not only to find, but to purchase and to get, and that it looks good and they feel proud putting it in somebody's folder. You know, can I, sorry, one more thing to add on that. Yeah, is, absolutely. Is that, um, Cause I said, I, I, I talked about how much time it takes, but also how much expense it takes. Uh, the amount of money that we've poured into our company is quite handsome for like um, conventions and, 
Oh, the, the website, how much that costs to um, create and maintain. We had one piece on Texas Allstate one year. That was Tim's piece. It was Salve Regina. And that's what basically bought the new website, mm -hmm. which was really exciting. Um, but yeah, it, it takes lots and lots of money to, to do all that as well. And so I think that there are a lot of people that think, I'm going to self-publish, I'm going to do this and get started. And they're like, wow, I had no idea it was going to be so much work. Yeah. And, and that, that is the truth. And that's, that's, that's part of why we're here too, is we wanted, you know, to make it easier on, um, on people who wanted something in the middle um, or just a different kind of model than the traditional model. So it's, it's really, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, that's okay. I, I didn't mean to talk on top of you, but to, just to kind of encapsulate what you guys have said in the last few minutes is first of all, you have to you have to find a way to get your music in front of the people who want it, which is marketing. Then you need to make sure it looks good because we do judge books by their cover and we judge scores by the quality of the engraving. Yeah. And then you have to make it easy for the director and the performer to not only access it, but pay you for it and hear it and listen to it and explore it before that, right? Yep. <laughs> So it. that is that kind of the encapsulation of what self-publishing means? Because for you, I'll just I think so. I, another thing is, and it's and it's tougher when you're when you're younger, or starting out, or your catalog is smaller. But I think you can afford to be uh, picky about which pieces you self-publish. And um, in the beginning, maybe you want to have every single thing you've ever written out there available to purchase. And then as time goes by, to be honest with yourself and your work, and say you know what, this piece right here, I've never been too proud of, and it hasn't sold, and that piece might be diluting your presence, whether it's online or an email or whatever. Um, if, some, if that's the first piece somebody stumbles upon, which could happen, right, with, with search terms and, and clicks and things, is that gonna, gonna lead them deeper into your work, or is it gonna turn them away? And if you can honestly say, I don't think that's worth having out there, pull it. You know, and it, having one less piece out there with your name on it isn't going to take you down a notch when you're applying for a grant or an award or whatever. But as far as creating your online brand presence, that it, you know, be honest about that so you can keep your brand strong and you can keep your best foot forward. Number seven is episode 139 with Dale Trimbor. Dale has agreed to come on the podcast multiple times with me. She's always a pleasure to speak with. And in this episode, we were discussing the, the most recent CD that she had produced and recorded with the Coral Arts Initiative in Southern California called How to Go On. We discussed the marketing strategy that CAI and the conductor Brandon Elliott and Dale had come up with and what their plan was to get this out in front of the world. It's an incredibly valuable for those of us who are trying to get our music, our recorded music and our printed music into the hands of the people that we want to serve our audience. So there's a lot of really good pieces of advice here. We also discuss um, social, how to use uh, blogging as a way to raise your platform and many, many other things. It is nice to show, especially in, in these moments of, of great success, to, to show what it actually feels like to get there and what it feels like in the process. And so often what it feels like in the process is, is failure or worrying or things that are not positive emotions. I think um, looking, at, looking at people winning prizes or getting performances or whatever on Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter, anything, um, it's easy to imagine like, oh, well, like things are just set for them now. Like, well, they, they won that thing. That, so they must be ecstatic and like, now they're, you know, like they, they don't have to work for it anymore. Or something. <laughs> but they, but you do like if things, things move on and that uh, the sort of high of winning an award or whatever that, that fades eventually. It's a wonderful feeling and it's fleeting. And then you have to go back to work. You have to keep composing and or writing articles or whatever. Like it, it's not, it's a process. It's all a process, not um, not a goal for any one specific measure of achievement. And if you don't feel like you're doing good work, then almost nothing else matters. 
So you have to believe in your own work first? Is that what you're saying? I think so. I think, I mean, for me, it's been, I know some people like agonize over composing, but for, for me, the last, I don't know, this, this lifetime of composing has been about sort of untangling um, everything that comes up in the actual creative process so that I've gotten to the point where I just show up for the most part. I still stress out about things when I'm writing, <laughs> but I get to, I get to the, the paper or notating things in the computer, wherever I am, the piano, um, and I just do it. And I've built in room for myself to have bad days, to have days when I don't feel like composing. Um, at this point, I feel like I've been there before. So when I, when I notice all this resistance within myself, I either, I know how to push through it or I know to step away for a little bit and come back. And I don't add extra anxiety to that feeling. Like I don't add layers of guilt and whatever about the composing process. Right. And you've actually written on that, especially that new yeah. music box article that you referenced deals with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have to just like show up and do it sometimes. And I'm still right. learning that that's future articles will be now on everything that surrounds composing, um, how to how to keep, I don't know. I'm like, I, I can be a very anxious in my head person at times. Uh-huh. And so it's constantly figuring out how to stop myself from those moments where I'm like, well, like, yes, this good thing just happened, but now, like, what happens next? I don't know. <laughs> Everything might go terribly and maybe no one's ever going to do my music again, which like I, I think sometimes and I realize just how absurd that is, but that doesn't mean I'm not occasionally thinking that. Number six in our list of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 130 with Ravi Krishnaswamy. Ravi is co-owner and co-founder of Copilot Music, a music production house based in New York City. Ravi has been composing for films and trailers and games for many, many years, and he wrote a series of articles for New Music Box called Stuff I've Learned Writing Music for Advertising. And I was completely blown away by what he was saying and how much I learned and from these articles, so I invited him onto the podcast, and we discussed some of these things at length. What it takes to break into the sync music scene. Sync means synchronization, so you're licensing your music out for use in commercial products and trailers and everything else. And really his thoughts that building a career in music is building relationships because we are in a relationship business and you need to show up and be present and manage your network in a way that deepens and provides value to the people that you're meeting. It's not about you shoving your music or your business card in people's faces. It's about actually becoming friends with people, building real relationships. One thing that I've learned is that building a career, you know, in, in the music world is, is basically relationship building and it's a super long game and you don't want to judge you don't want to judge how useful your work in relationship building and building your reputation in an industry is simply on where you're at at that moment in time. You want to think about um, the fact that people change jobs, people evolve, your clients evolve. Um, somebody that was an assistant producer at an at an ad agency four years later could be a head, you know, head of broadcast production and very powerful. And so one thing that I try to do is, you know, sometimes I don't look at these as networking opportunities where I'm going out and trying to meet people and talk to people. I actually just look at these as opportunities to be seen, Mm -hmm. to be regularly seen as part of this industry, because I think that, um, building your reputation in an industry in, in an industry is really important. And uh, somebody might simply see you every year at an award show and you start to become part of the landscape 
Um, and if you're not there, you're not part of that landscape. But that leads me to another discussion. That is, it's also a topic you brought up in your new Music Box articles because a lot of this um, commercial media work is work for hire, mm -hmm. which means the person who's paying for the music owns the rights. I think um, if you're looking to to work on jingles at a certain level, the expectation is work for hire. And I think if you're looking to work in games at a certain level, that the expectation is work for hire. But the only time you get pushback is when the budget doesn't reflect what they're getting. And so one of the really big ways that jingles have ev the jingle industry has evolved in the last five years is that actually a lot of our work is starting to become uh, licensed rather than a work for hire because agencies are cutting their music budgets. And so companies like mine say, okay, well, um, you have 50% of what you had last year for this kind of work. Um, that's fine. We can write it, but instead of giving you a work for hire, we'd like to keep the, the, uh, the rights long term. We'll license it to you for a certain period of time and a certain territory and media. Uh, so the, to, to try to answer your question, the way that I always look at it is, is it's simply sort of a, it's a, you, you know, a function of the budget. Um, if they have the money for a work for hire, I'm totally happy selling it to them because collecting publishing royalties on advertising work or gaming work is very tricky. And I often call that the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, so I'd rather be paid up front for the work if I can, if it's a healthy budget and move on to the next project. Um, I don't feel the need to own that music long term, especially when it's really written specifically with a client's needs and creative ideas um, and written specifically to a piece of media. I don't feel the need to to hold on to that work if the budget is there. I'd rather have the money up front. I'd rather have a healthy budget and a, and a work for hire than a thin budget and a retaining ownership on something that I have no idea, you know, I can license again. Because then the burden of licensing it, marketing it, following up on um, royalty income is all yours mm -hmm. then rather mm -hmm. than just receiving a, a lump sum up front. I get it. And, and one of the interesting things in the industry is that, you know, everything is, it's funny because everything is sort of cyclical and kind of, you know, goes back and forth. And so the jingle industry has really gotten into licensing rather than work for hire. But then you start to see um, the headaches that they have to deal with when uh, they've licensed something, but all of a sudden their usage needs change. They want to run it internationally or run it on broadcast and they had only licensed it for um, internet usage. And so they in some ways they're they've put themselves in the position where they're starting to learn the value of work for hire in practice again mm. like you know they keep they kept cutting their budgets and cutting their budgets and so we pulled the work for hire off the table and started carving out smaller and smaller licenses and now they're starting to say oh here's the value once we have it we can do whatever we want with it um it, it's um you know, there's a there's a real value to that freedom for them that that they're now um, appreciating that they didn't appreciate a while back. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I mean, you even say this in the very first article that one good sync deal can make your year. Sure. And so, like, it, it's in your benefit as the composer to maintain the rights, despite all the management issues. But it's in their benefit to do the work for hire, especially as they expand their advertising campaign or whatever, like you just said. Right. And I think, you know, again, I think the rules are really different for music that you're writing specific to media based on a creative brief that they're handing you and your own music. And, and I, I would certainly, 
um, advise, you know, composers who are looking to build a career to, to retain ownership of their own music, because that's, that's your, um, that's your opportunity to get that one big license and, and the pricing for a license for an artist that has, um, you know, a footprint in the industry or a reputation or a certain amount of followers um, is very different than the price that we even get for a work for hire. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be, you know, it could be a lot more money to, to, to simply license for a year a song from an artist that's well known versus owning a piece of music that I'm writing for them as a work for hire. So I think the rules are different, you know, depending on on wh whether you're coming to it from a licensing and sync uh, perspective or coming from it coming to it from an original composition perspective. Number five on the list of the ten most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 127 with the incredible Scott Teggy. Scott Teggy is the tubist of the Gaudete Brass Quintet based in Chicago. And I first encountered Scott at the Midwest Clinic in 2016, and we quickly became friends. He's an incredible individual, and the next time I was in Chicago, he invited me over to his apartment where we recorded this interview. He has incredible business insights, what it takes to engage an audience, what it takes to put your uh, events out in front of the people that you want to show up, buy a ticket, and sit in the seats. And he thinks it's we need to change the way we're thinking about engagement and the way we're thinking about advertising our stuff. It's about communication. It's about being flexible. It's about showing up to concerts yourself and learning how to sell your music and to speak in public. Some of the reason why I think I've stayed so heavily in teaching is, is I want to be able to help students. I want to show them. And I think, you know, the, one of the best ways to teach is by modeling, you know. And I want to show these students, you know, that you can be creative. You can make something happen. It's, it's hard. You can't show, teach them to be creative. But I think you can show them how you're being creative. And they can see that that is possible. That that dream is, is, can be a reality that you can have a life in music and be creative and not be beholden to the one job. And so, you know, I am fortunate that teaching at these colleges, I work with college students, but then also teaching younger students. I teach through this, uh, the Merritt School of Music. It's a community music school here in Chicago, and they put me in a South Side neighborhood. And uh, I have this, like, core of 12 tuba players coming out of the school that they've gotten into, into higher-level high schools that are performing arts schools magnets, because they uh, have had success on tuba that gets them out of their neighborhood high school, which is not a very good school because of this. And you watch how, you know, through modeling, how the older students are mentoring the younger students. So, hey, man, go home and practice. Take your tuba home because you don't have to go to this high school. We can get you to a better high school where there is a future because a lot of the kids in that neighborhood, high school is most of them don't finish. And most of them, their path is probably, if they finish high school, is not going to college. You know, most of them would be. So through music, we can sort of create this different expectation for these, these communities and change that sort of thing. And I think the more that, you know, we can all talk about that and share that and show, you know, for me to show my college students, hey, look what I'm doing over here, you know, with these kids. Like, this could be you, you know, and... You, you can make some, you know, a living doing this and you can be helping the culture and you're, you're creating an audience for yourself. And so, you know, when the quintet has concerts here in Chicago, you know, man, you better believe I call on all my students. Be like, hey guys, come support, come out, come check out what we're doing. Check out why my schedule sucks so bad for scheduling, <laughs> you know, because this is what's taking up a lot of my time. Yeah. And, you know, and so you're, you're, again, you're showing them things can be different. You know, that it doesn't have to fall into the same mold, the same expectation of life. You know, um, you know, even the, after this today, I coach at the Chicago Youth Symphony. Um, and, you know, I never coach arrangements there. Like, I refuse. And all my teaching for coaching chamber music, it's, it's plain standard repertoire for the brass quintet. Maybe it's not new pieces written in the last 10 years just because they have to learn some standard stuff, you know, just that their basis is covered. But we're at least thinking outside the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, on what is possible, you know, in, in the music world. And so, um, you know, and so we're, I'm, I'm trying from these young kids and early ages to 
have them think differently about what it means to be a musician today. Yeah. What is one thing that you think, I mean, maybe it's all tied into what you're saying about changing uh, the, the culture, helping kids experience new things that composers can do today to drive their career forward? I would say first, I would say go to more concerts hear what other people are doing, see what other people, what other groups are programming, and, you know, see how the musicians are playing. I think we're all busy, or levels of busy, um, and it's really easy, even as a musician, to, like, you know, I do music all day. Some, there's some nights where I'm just tired. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I don't really want to go to that concert. I mean, I want to, but I just, you know, if I had, you know, a couple hours to be at home, sort of decompress, but I forced myself to get in the car and go and learn. And I think, you know, more composers can get out there and listen to music. Um, I think pushing their forward, uh, I'm generally uh, a passive person when it comes to life, just general life. Um, in my music career, I'm pretty aggressive. And I think too many people are not salesmen aggressive in that way. You know why there's so many composers, why should I commission you? You know, what are you, what are you offering me? You know, if you're approaching me, you know, obviously if I'm approaching you, I've already done my homework on why I want to commission you. But if you're, you know, you don't have a career yet, you need to be approaching people. And so what's your 30 second? What's, what's your dream? Sell them on the dream. You know, every time when I work on contracts for the quintet and I'm the book, I do the bookings for the group. I, don't, I talk price as late as possible because you sell someone on the dream there's always a way to figure out how to fund the dream. Yeah. You know, but if you worry so much about the price first, well, then the dream's lost, yeah. you know? And so what is this, you know, maybe you have a, a composer approached us a couple of years ago and it hasn't come through yet, but we keep talking about a brass quintet and piano work. And he brought this to us and we applied for some grants together because he seemed so passionate about this. Like we weren't seeking out this piece at all because, you know, for us to even, I mean, the collaboration would be great, but we can't really tour with a sixth member. It gets a lot more challenging, you know, to do that. But he was so passionate about this dream. So we started applying for grants and then none of them have come through. So we you know, loosely looking for some other funding, but he wants to just write this piece. And so he's going to start writing and we're going to go along and see what we can do. You know, maybe we can, if we can't fund the piece, he's a pianist and he wants to play the piano part. You know, maybe we can find a concert series to present the premiere and we can give him, you know, sort of most of the concert fee. You know, as an opportunity, maybe that's a way or a larger cut of it to pay him for his time. And, you know, potentially then maybe we can record it with him and have a sort of a professional level recording of this piece. So I think sell people on the dream and know what that dream is and be able to vocalize the dream. I think so many musicians, we can't vocalize what happens upstairs or what we feel inside. You know, it's like, oh, I, I just love this. Well, you got to tell someone why you love it. Yeah. You know, well, I love this, this, and this, you know, and then people can, you know, especially who are not in music, who maybe, you know, want to fund something, you know, they need those specifics. Number four of our 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 133 with Jeff Rona. And this was part two of a two-part interview that I did with Jeff. In March of 2017, I had the opportunity to fly out to LA to work with some schools that were part of a consortium that had commissioned me to write some band music. So while I was in LA, I took advantage of the time to have a couple mind-blowing interviews, and Jeff was one of them. He invited me into his composition studio, and we sat down for over two hours and recorded this conversation, which I then broke up into two episodes. Jeff has written a, a book on what it takes to score films and te television called The Real World. I highly, highly recommend it. He scored multiple games and movies and he's actually got his own production companies he's created his own sample libraries and virtual instruments he's really got it all he's doing everything we discussed the difference between composing versus producing getting your you're the team around you that's going to help you do it what it takes to market yourself as a composer and why you really shouldn't be out there trying to please everybody that's not going to serve anyone in the end 
film music isn't pop music. Film music isn't classical music. Film music isn't jazz music. Film music is film music, even though it isn't a genre or style. It's an approach. It's an attitude. And that's a lot of where open-mindedness comes in. You have to be willing to be experimental with every part of your being. You have to be willing to try things and fail, both both in your in your work life as well as in the act, the music itself. You have to be willing to admit when you're wrong. You have to be willing to try new things. You have to be willing to hear something that somebody else has done and go, well, I never would have thought of that, but that's bloody awesome. And I'm going to see if I can do my version of that. So somebody does something that's just wickedly cool and people notice and you think, well, how can I make that? How can I own that? So it's not exactly ripping off, but it's being inspired by your whole world. It means not not determining that I'm only this and I'm only that. I've certainly met composers who said, I only want to write orchestral music. I only want to write like John Williams. I only want to write this. I only want to write that. Guaranteed failure. Not because you've limited yourself to 1% of the projects out there, but because you've exhibited closed-mindedness. And the minute you do that, you're useless. You're useless as an artist. You're useless as a collaborator. And you're useless in terms of what your next three projects are going to be. I think that's awesome advice. It's not advice. It's just an attitude. Yeah, but if you because if I wouldn't begin to know that, how to tell. How do you tell somebody to be open minded? I can say well, you be, be open minded. <laughs> okay, now what? <laughs> it's hard. It's yeah. hard because of course we have opinions, and opinions are organic. You know, you take a bite of something that, and you go, "Look, this is disgusting." Mm-hmm. Did you make it? Was is that closed mindedness? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have certain members of my family who might say yes. Well, yeah, we, you know, look, I believe that part of my, of who I am as a composer is that I'm not only a creator, but I'm also a filter. And that filtration system is that I determine if something is good or not by my standards. Yes. I get it right. And I also get it wrong, but it's vital, vital for me to, make decisions about good, not good, and anything in between. In fact, I would go so far as to saying the only difference I've ever observed in the difference between a good composer and a not good composer is that a good composer knows when they've written crap and they throw it away and do it again. And a bad composer says, yay, look what I just did. You had said composers need to develop a set of skills, and this is in your definition of what business is. What are the business skills composers need to have? So we're, what we're talking about now are the multiplicity of hats. Yes. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, that's such a, a cocky thing to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so look, <laughs> shut up, listen, and learn. <laughs> so a, a composer isn't hired to write music. A composer is hired to produce the score, the recording that will then be used in the film. And there's a huge difference between composing the music and producing the recording that ends up in the movie. Composing music does not cost a dime. Producing the score, the recording of the score that appears in the, in the project, costs money. It involves a budget. It involves people. It involves collaborations with whomever, orchestrator, contractor, musicians, engineer, all of those things. And it's really important if you're a composer getting started to always surround yourself with people who are more experienced and better at what they do than you are at what you do. In fact, I don't think that ever goes away. Every composer should always work with a team of people who are ridiculously good. And what's wonderful is that those ridiculously good people, like engineers, are always looking for new clients. And so they're willing to sometimes step in. You'd be It's shocking sometimes how... Really, really well-known artists, well, engineers, orchestrators, are willing to do projects at more or less free if they really like the music and they think that person's going somewhere. I want to be on their team for the the long run. So a composer gets the job, manages the job, manages the team involved with the job, manages the calendar and the and the schedule so you are you are now you are now managing the the company you are managing the group of people and it may just be you and maybe nobody else 
but you're still dealing with resources. You're still dealing with a budget and a schedule. And that's pretty key. So as I was saying, the reason I love reading about business people isn't because I necessarily admired the thing that they do that made them successful. It's that they had the attitudinal muscles to figure it out because we all kind of figured out for ourselves. I don't think, you know, you can't learn this stuff in school. There's no school that teaches this sort of thing. Number three on our list of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 123 with Jim Stevenson. Jim is a composer living in the Chicago area, and I first encountered his music again at the Midwest Clinic, where the Marine Band was performing his Symphony Number no. 2. They had commissioned it, and this was the premier performance, and it was really, really good. Jim has had incredible success moving from an arranger into composition, and now he's just writing full-time. And he's built a team with his wife and a few other people that make Stevenson music happen. We discuss a lot in this episode, including just letting it happen to you, not uh, trying to manufacture your career. But you have to be self-critical, you have to be patient, you have to keep the door open for all possibilities. We discuss what it means to write into the center of the bullseye for what the market is hot for right now, and giving them what they need, not exactly what they want. He's also 100% self-published, so we discuss how he's self-publishing and his best tips for composers who want to self-publish. Uh, when I first started composing, I wrote a tuba concerto for a tuba in a brass quintet, and um, I met a publisher uh, almost right away. I'm about a 25-year-old kid at that point and um, had just started composing, and I was really excited. Oh my gosh, my music is going to get published. And uh, so they took it on, and um, you know, I got a statement the following year, and it had sold 50 copies or something like that, and I got a check for, I think it was $50. I'm not totally sure, but you know, the amount was so low compared to how many I sold that I, and again, let me remind you, I come from an entrepreneurial father uh, who started his own business. And so I was just thinking, you know, this doesn't seem right that I, I'm the one who wrote this music and uh, barely made any money off it. So it was a conscious decision at age 25 or 26 that I would go the route of publishing my own music. Now this is about 20 years ago. So the landscape was quite different back then. You know, it wasn't as easy to make your music look pretty and all that fun stuff. But, um, so I've been self publishing for about 20 years. I will say that, um, as far as the marketing goes, I am still very much an organic marketer. And what I mean by that is I kind of think of somebody who should know about my music. Um, and I let them know. You know, this maybe happens 10 times a day. I think, oh, I, re- I need to let this conductor know about my music. Bam, send an email. Uh, I need to, oh yeah, I had a friend who was looking for a new trumpet concerto or something. I wonder if we should try to work together. Bam, send an email. Um, I have tried, especially when I started out, I did some of the mass marketing, you know, email blast kind of thing. And I don't really keep up with that too much. I'll send something out maybe once every three or four months. But I have found, number one, I don't like doing that uh, because I don't feel it's very personal. And I'd like to consider myself a a rather personal guy. I like meeting people. I like people, as I've already said. So sending a a mass email just doesn't feel like me, so I don't do that too often. Um, And secondly, I don't really feel like I've gotten a ton of response from that. So my goal is usually just to send the 10 communications a day or a week or something like that, that are directed at people I know and people who I already know would be interested in what I have to offer rather than just hoping that they might be. And when you send these, I'm assuming they're mostly emails, you are trying to highlight a specific piece, not just go browse my website. It's more, Hey, I just finished this thing. Or you, would you consider doing X or Y on your next season? I mean, how do you frame it? Or maybe it's totally different. Yeah. You, if you try to hit them over the head with too much information, I think especially these days we're all so busy. Right. And if we get an email that's two pages long, 
I'm still kind of guilty of this, I have to admit, but if I'm, I'm trying to shrink them a little bit. Um, but yeah, if, you, if it's too much information, they're just going to get lost. Um, it usually has to do with a piece, going back to what we talked about earlier, you know, a piece for me that has proven to be successful and that I know or think would make them successful as well. Um, and maybe I have a, a quote from a review or a recording that I can link really easily, but it's something that, um, I know they might be looking for, you know, I'm not going to send some off the wall piece to a conductor. I know prefers, you know, more classical music or something. I'm just making that up, but you 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 have to get to know the, you have to get to know these people and feel like what you have to offer will fit inside of their, uh, project ideas and programs. Um, and then of course, you know, we're talking about Facebook. You probably see that I'm pretty, uh, we're talking about marketing, excuse me, but you see that I'm pretty active on Facebook. And, and again, that's always just, um, honestly trying to put out there what's going on. I'm not trying, I don't believe in hype. You know, I don't try to make something bigger than it actually is. It's like, Hey, this is what's going on. Hope to see you there. Uh, or maybe you're interested in it and contact me if you are that kind of thing. And just doing that has sort of hopefully given me a persona of somebody that people like and can trust, that kind of thing. Number two on our list of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 117 with David and Matthew Maslanka. David passed away this year, and so I re-released this episode in memoriam, but 117 was the original interview. In this interview, David tells us how he moved from teaching academically, building his career, and making the decision to become a full-time composer. How he got to choose where he wants to live so that he can have the lifestyle he wants to have. And since his son, Matthew, runs the business of Maslanka Press, we discussed the business end of his music. What it, what they're doing, because they self-publish as well, to get the music out there, to meet the needs, to manage speaking and clinicking and commission opportunities, as well as their thoughts on selling and not renting your music and how you just have to work hard. Part of David's message is to show up and do the work. Well, this is a, a very, very difficult issue for um, any composers. Composers, for the most part, are introverted people. Um, and I don't know if you are, but I am. Um, and it is was extremely difficult for me uh, to put myself forward. Uh, so my fundamental was always composing. I was driven to compose, and so uh, I wrote music. And I tried to follow the leads as best I could. I'd simply contact the people that were offered to me, and uh, and then people began to contact me. Um, it is just one step at a time. You find the performance you can, and then you work with the people if you have that opportunity. Uh, and those are the building blocks for um, for making the career aspect of it. I suppose others could be much more aggressive about uh, seeking the uh, the contacts. Um, it took me a long incubation phase, you might think of it that way. Um, I started composing when I was 18. Uh, the Child's Garden of Dreams piece was written 20 years later, and that was essentially my breakthrough piece uh, for Winds. Uh, and you know, I've had successes with other music, uh, but individual performances, no grand success as such. Um, and it just simply took that long. It's been a continuous, slow movement of accumulation. And I can say that if you make the beginning efforts to get performances, and if your music is any good, first off, if your music has something and that people do, do respond to it, then it begins to open, however gradually. You know, a single performance might happen, like you had your first uh, performance and you had your prize, and you said, well, the heavens have opened. Well, that fire went out pretty quick. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you have to realize that the fire goes out. You say, oh, 
and then you try another and another and another. And if you continue enough, then some burning embers just start to glow and eventually some smoke forms and then eventually a small flame happens that doesn't go out. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a long haul. You know, I've been at this for, oh God, I've been writing music for 55 years. Yeah? <laughs> there were the moments in which without my seeming to have done anything, there was a sort of an exponential advance in the number of performances and then it would advance again and again and again. And so, Success is about persistence at the basic level of um, writing good music. That's the start. You can't get away from that. Uh, and then a bit at a time, having people respond to it, and then that collects. So but if you're things? persistent, yeah, you know, like let's say it's it's about persistence uh, uh, about who you are. So I think maybe my best quality as a as a as a uh, musician and as a composer is simply persistence. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're talking about persistence here. It's not just about uh, going after the next commission or, you know, making sure your network know who you are, but it also comes into the music as well. Uh, another one of the things that you keep on saying is about how a lot of works get to the hard part and then stop. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that people respond to most strongly about your music is that you get to the hard part and then you figure out the hard part and you go on. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's what we all look for in, in, in art. It's like, how do we, how do we deal with this stuff? Number one in our list of the 10 most popular episodes of 2017 is episode 132 which is part one of Jeff Rona's interview. But before I tell you a little bit more about this episode, I want to remind you that you can support the podcast by subscribing to the podcast in whatever podcast playing app you are using and to support the show on Patreon. $1 a month is all I'm asking for, and it'll allow me to do more by hiring an editor to outsource this work so I can do more content creation for you so I can create the material that is going to help you as you build your career, no matter what kind of composer you are. So in episode 132, the first part of this interview, we discussed Jeff's studio, his uh, virtual instrument company, Wide Blue Sound, what it means to brand yourself creating opportunities and the three reasons to say yes to any film. I also had the opportunity to ask Jeff about the trends happening in content creation now, including streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime, and how the industry is moving forward. And we end this part of the interview by discussing how we can differentiate ourselves and how we don't get to always choose all the parts of our career. The fact is, is it's harder and harder to be, it's harder and harder to make a decent living as a film composer strictly, and you're the one, you know, if your entire portfolio is just uh, feature films, that's hard. Because if you're breaking in, you are doing small films. And if you are doing small films, you're lucky to get a budget that even covers your expenses. And by the way, you should do those films. You should do movies even if it means losing a little bit, if it means building up a few credits, because those credits will be useful and the relationships you built along the way too well at times well let's say that there are three reasons to say yes to a film let's say that there are three re reasons to say yes to anything and the reasons are number one they're going to write you a good a good check and you'll be able to pay rent and you know upgrade to the really good cheese or whatever money do a movie because they're going to pay you and it's lovely to get paid to do something you would do for free. Number two is, well, the money's not so good, but this is a really good project. This is a this is a this has some prestige. I would it would mean a lot to me to have my name attached to this film because I think it has a good shot of getting some success, even if it's in the festival circuit. But my name's going to get out there attached to a really good film. The third reason is. Well, it doesn't pay. It's not even a particularly good film. 
But these filmmakers actually seem like they're they're really ambitious. They're really going places. They, you know, they've either done something notable or have plans to do something notable. And then it's just about one thing, which is building a relationship. If you're willing to sweat blood to score a project for no other reason than to build a relationship with a, a person who you speculatively think will go on to do bigger and better with actual paydays and they might be loyal. It's you're it's, it's risky. Well, all three are risky. Well, the money one isn't risky because as long as the check clears, you're in good shape, but that's not a good reason to be. I mean, you can't be in it for the money before other things. Anybody who thinks that they're going to become a film composer because they're going to be able to afford a nice house and play golf every day. That's not likely. It's just not likely. And I think that seems to be a theme of this, of this show that you do. Mm -hmm. It's a good attitude to say, I'm going to, I'm going to really work hard at pursuing this career because I love it. Or I think I would. I mean, obviously if you haven't done it before, you might be unpleasantly surprised that it's not fun or it's not fulfilling or it's not, you're not cut out for it. You know, you're just not that good a writer or you're the style that you're good at. Isn't the style that's particularly in vogue at the moment. And that's something we could talk about some more, you know, what makes a useful composer, you know, what makes it desirable, not useful, useful as you show up <laughs> and you finish. <laughs> um, but if you come at it from at first, anyway, strictly from a monetary perspective of, I'm going to write a score and I'm going to get an agent and that agent's going to hand me, you know, say good news. We got you double the money on this project is the last project. You're going to be, you're going to be upset. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be, you're going to be disillusioned. I think there are, you know, there are some people who hit it out of the ballpark. It's not very often, you know, we like with any field, you know, somebody who's never acted before and then they star in a movie that becomes a huge hit. And all of a sudden their life is on fire. That's great. You know, as you probably well know, some people spend years and years and years to become an overnight sensation. Yes. They fly under the radar and they fly under the radar and they stick with it through good and bad and bad and worse. And then suddenly one day the stars align, the planets align and something good happens. And then you're the guy they want. I think the For phrase now. is. 10 years to overnight success. I can't even begin to think that one should put a number on it. Well, that's just you know, a the question might be usage. Yeah. The question you, you might ask yourself as a, as a artist getting started in a, in a very unreliable field is how long are you willing to try before you uh, decide to step out? Mm -hmm. You know, for which I have no answer. I don't have any other marketable skills of any kind. So, you know, if I get clobbered over the head, I'll just come back the next day and get clobbered again. Once again, thank you so much for being a listener of this podcast. I really do create this for you. I've got enough episodes in the can to get us through half of the year already. So subscribe to the podcast and these will be delivered to your phone automatically. Become a Patreon sponsor and help me do this in an even bigger scale. And then I want to know what your questions are, what your problems are, and how I can help you. What are the, the issues that are in your way that are preventing you from getting your career to where you want it to be? Send me an email, go to the contact page on PortfolioComposer.com. Find me on social, whatever it takes. Let me know how I can help you. But composers, you've got this. It is possible to create a career as a composer in the 21st century if you think like a business owner and if you are willing to create a portfolio style vocation where you have multiple streams of income. All right, composers, you've got this. 